be okay. So we're recording this. We'll have this online for friends and colleagues that would like to check it out later. Um, thank you for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what part of the world you are tuning in from. I am Tyler Shores. I run the Think Lab program for the University of Cambridge, and today we're very excited to be hosting Professor Temple Grandin uh, from Colorado State University. Um, Temple is running a minute or two late, so she's going to join us in just a second, but I'll get the introductions out of the way um, while she joins us. Uh, Temple Grandin, of course, is a uh, world-renowned um, author and speaker on both autism and animal, be animal behavior. Um, she has uh, appeared numerous times in national and international press, being appearing on everything from national public radio, NPR in the U.S. to the BBC. Um, interestingly enough, and I'm sure she might mention it as well, um, HBO made it an Emmy award-winning movie about her life starring uh, Claire Danes, which is very good, um, very enjoyable for anyone that's interested in checking that out. Um, I could go on, but nobody really wants to hear more from me. Um, so we're just basically, Temple should be joining us in about a minute or so, uh, we're hoping here. And she, of course, she'll be talking about her new book, Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and um, uh, what's the last part? Um, patterns and Abstractions. So hopefully this will be a fairly interactive event. So we'll have reserve about the first 35, 40 minutes for uh, Temple to speak. And then we want to make sure that we have ample time for questions and answers. And she'll try to get to as many of you um, as we can. So feel free to use the chat or I will keep an eye on um, if anyone wants to raise their virtual hand and um, we can take questions live. So I think that is everything that I need to say. Uh, while we're waiting for Temple to join us in just a minute, um, feel free to say hello in the chat. I'd be curious what part of the world you're coming in from. Um, be curious if you've read the book or read any of other Temple Grandin's work um, while we're waiting. So uh, make some virtual friends for a little bit and um, or feel free to hang out for just a moment. But she texted me and she said she should be here soon. So while I'm vamping for time, basically, to wait for her to join us, I can give you a little bit of background about how this event came into being. So uh, for the Think Lab at the University of Cambridge, Cambridge we've run a, a couple of projects that have involved um, neurodiversity in the workplace in particular. So uh, looking at autism, employability, neurodiversity, and accessibility with a couple of private companies in the UK, as well as the BBC. And um, uh, I just happened to email Temple Grandin and asked for her thoughts and opinions on some of this. And she was kind enough to donate some of her time. And uh, that's how she has been able to join us. Oh, and I think she's with us. Hello, Temple. Can you see? Yep, us? I got Hi. here. I just got finished answering questions about dairy cattle behavior and dog behavior. And I'm I got a little bit tight on the schedule there. And I had a no few problem. more questions. Okay. We're glad you're here. I've done introductions and everyone is thoroughly bored of hearing me. So I think we might turn it over to you if you'd like. And I've got your slides ready. Okay. Well, that um, that sounds just really, really good. And um, the thing I want to talk about today is different kinds of thinking. And we really do need different kinds of minds. And there's research now that shows that different kinds of thinking exist, especially when you've got individuals that might have an autism label, a dyslexia label, or some other label. So we can go on to the next slide. Now, the thing I want to ask is what would happen to some of the great innovators that we had in the past if they'd been in today's educational system? Einstein had no speech until age three. Um, Steve Jobs was bullied in school. He was probably on the spectrum. You know, another person that's probably on the spectrum is Elon Musk. You know, what would happen to them? Michelangelo that I just showed you, uh, he was probably on the autism spectrum, a grubby little kid who dropped out of school, but he got exposed to great art and he grew up using stone cutting tools. This brings up a really important thing with careers. I got into the cattle industry because I was exposed to it when I was a teenager. Getting into good careers starts with exposure and then mentoring. Let's go to the next slide. Now, Thomas Edison was a, a school dropout, hyperactive. 
had some good teachers. He also had a mentor that taught him how to use telegraph. And then he had tons of patents. Well, he would have just been considered naughty boy today. And we can go on to the next slide. Jane Goodall, she did her famous work with a two-year secretarial degree. Would that have been possible today? In the US, that's equivalent to a junior college or community college degree, secretary and shorthand and stuff like that. Would that be possible today? And she was probably a really great visual thinker. We'll go to the next slide. Steven Spielberg, dyslexic, rejected from a top film school, bullied in school. One of the things that helped him, he had a movie camera when he was a child. You see, that's exposure. We've got kids growing up today that don't use tools. We're actually getting a huge shortage right now of people to fix equipment in factories. And we got people growing up that have never used a tool, never used a ruler. I had a girl in my class that never used a ruler. And they're going to make policy about seriously stuff like energy. And they have no practical experience. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this is one of my most important slides. This is the different kinds of thinking. I'm what's called an object visualizer. And I'm an extreme object visualizer. Can't do algebra. I wouldn't be able to graduate from high school today. Now, the kind of things that my kind of mind's good at is mechanics, all kinds of mechanical stuff, um, art, photography, and animals. Because animals work in a, in a sensory-based world. Art and mechanics go together. And some of these autistic adults that are addicted to video games, you introduce them to car mechanics, they find that's more interesting. And in my new book, Visual Thinking, right here, I have a whole chapter on research that shows these different kinds of thinkers exist. Now, a lot of people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking, but you get a label, you tend to be extreme. Then the next type is visual spatial. This is pattern thinking. This is mathematicians, chemists, physicists, computer programmers, and music. Math and music tend to go together. And then, of course, you've got your verbal thinkers who think in words. Now, what's really important is we want to get these different kinds of thinkers to collaborate. And when Betsy Lerner and I worked on visual thinking, I'd write the rough drafts and kind of associative, um, not very well organized. Betsy would straighten it all out. Verbal thinking is much more linear, much more linear, much more top down, big general principles. But how do we implement something? Right now, the issue we've got right now here is, OK, this computer and this kitchen is powered by our coal fired power station. I've actually been on the property. I've watched them dump the coal into the thing. and. Yeah, we need to phase that out. But let's say I'm worried that let's say we build a field of solar panels and big hail comes in and the coal fired power plants completely closed. Yeah, so I'm looking at how slow can I run that plant and keep it in good condition and maintain the expertise of the staff? You know, maybe run it at 10%. I've got some things I got to learn. Can I convert it to natural gas? Can I go back and forth between the fuels? There's some stuff I want to know. And I don't want to talk to the politicians. I don't want to talk to the president of the power company. I want to go down in the shop and talk to the guys who operate it. They can answer the questions. Yeah, they, um, yes, we have to phase it out. But um, I don't want something to happen to where then the solar panels are hailed. We have an ice storm that takes out the wind turbines. And then we have no electricity. That worries me. Yes, we do need to face it out. But we've got to do it in the right way. I've been doing a lot of thinking about that. My student, student did not know that the this town had a coal-fired power plant. They did not know that. And we got people that are going to make policy about this kind of stuff. And they don't even know where their own electricity comes from. You see, as a visual thinker, I'm seeing it. I know what the station looks like from the highway. I've never been inside it. But I've been in the grounds because my student raised bison on their property. I was over there for that. But you see, I see it. This is the thing. Visual thinking is not abstract. So you've got your object visualizer who can't do algebra. He's good at mechanics, art, animals, and photography. You've got your pattern mathematical thinkers, super good at physics, chemistry, music, and computer programming. I tried computer programming. Me and Bill Gates had access to the exact same computer, and I was not able to do it. He could. 
And then a lot of people are mixtures. Lots of people are mixtures. And there's been discussion about, you know, thinking styles. There's been some research that shows that thinking styles don't matter. Well, maybe that's true for the mixture people, but that's not true for someone like me. I had to learn to read with phonics. Let's go to the next slide. Turns out I got a big visual thinking circuit in my head. And we can go on to the next slide and show just another picture of that. And I'm going, wow, that's uh, that's really trippy. Let's go to the next slide. And this just shows that um, I, yeah, I have problems with multitasking. Now, the kind of things that an autistic person is bad at is multitasking. Another thing I'm very bad at is remembering long strings of verbal information, sequential information. I have a lot of trouble with that. So if I have to do a task like close out the cash drawer at the local store, give me a pilot's checklist, step one, step two, step three, just give me some bullet points to jog my memory. We'll go on to the next slide. Well, how do you figure out what kind of thinkers kids are? I get asked this question all the time. Visual thinkers like me, art, building things, tools, mechanical ability. Well, we got kids today growing up that don't use tools. Mathematics kid, when they might be uh, seven or eight years old, they really see them good at math, move my head in math. But they may need help with reading. Now, I was exposed to a um, little flute when I was a child. I was not able to do it. Another kid will take off with that. But when you get a label, dyslexia, autism, sensory processing disorder, ADHD, whatever, you tend to be more extreme one or the other. And when I was out working on building things in the meat plants, I'm going to estimate that 20% of the people I worked with that owned businesses, things like metal fabrication shops, were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And the problem is now they're not getting replaced. That's the problem. They're playing video games in the basement when they ought to be fixing cars. They can take some of those adults that are playing video games in the basement, introduce them to mechanics, and they may find that that's more interesting than video games. Let's go to the next slide. Now, my grandfather was the co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes, MIT trained mathematical engineer. So another guy that was on the autism spectrum come up with this crazy idea for making an autopilot. And everybody in aviation was trying to wire the plane's controls directly to the magnetic compass. What do you think happened? It did this. Everybody in aviation thought this was stupid. Well, they tinkered and they tinkered and they tinkered in a loft or a place where they fixed trains. And then it got stolen. And the stolen version was in every warplane during World War II. This is where they needed a lawyer. They needed their verbal thinker. This is where we do need all the different kinds of minds. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, schools need to be putting these classes back in. I get asked all the time, um, what can I do to fix the schools? I put in art, sewing, cooking, musical instruments, woodworking, theater, welding, auto shop. Now in the US, it varies a lot between different states, but we're paying the price now taking these classes out. I'm very, very concerned right now about skill loss on things like fixing factories. Right now, we're gonna be uh, putting in um, uh, all these plants are building electronic chips. Now, the thing that's interesting is the state-of-the-art electronic chip making machine comes from Holland. And this goes back to how their schools are. You can go the university route or tech, and they don't stick their nose up at tech. So they're making the state-of-the-art chip making machine, which we invented. We did the basic research on it. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, a Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby. That's another reason for keeping the creative classes. And when I was in elementary school, I had sewing, woodworking, and art. Those were my favorite classes. Cooking, I hated. In fact, I got out of cooking, and I was the second girl in my elementary school to take wood shop, and I loved it. Let me go to the next slide. Now, the thing is, how do you sell yourself when you're weird? How do you sell yourself? What I learned I had to do is I had to learn how to sell my work rather than myself. 
That's what I had to learn how to do. So the next slide, I'll show off some of my work. And I show customers my work. Now I've been doing a lot of talks with big corporations, steel company, an airline, computer companies, tech companies, banks, just got off with a um, company that makes uh, feed additives uh, for dairy cows, uh, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're not antibiotics, uh, all different kinds of companies. And one of the things that we discuss is changing the hiring process because the person that might be the best airplane mechanic, the very best programmer may interview really poorly. Now, what some of the tech companies have done is they bring them in like for techathons where they can programming contests. But for someone like me, let's, you wanna, I, I'm, you might wanna show off the car that you rebuilt. I'm very concerned about people like me aging out. I've been doing a little survey of gray hair, people fixing elevators, fixing escalators. I just was at a huge, one of our huge airports uh, about two weeks ago. They had an escalator all ripped apart. It's all conveyors. Looks like something from a meat plant and you see the conveyors inside and three out of four were gray. And I've been on some rather uh, poor elevators lately that did things like skipping floors. You see, that's where those tradespeople aren't getting replaced because the one place you don't need a university degree is in high-end skilled trades. I know people that started out as tiny little shops, one welding class, 30 years later, huge business and a corporate jet. Yeah, the skill, you know, but the thing that's happening is these people are not getting replaced. Let's go to the next slide. And that's the slide I used to sell Cargill. Back in the late eighties, I sent this uh, drawing to the head of Cargill. I designed the front end of every Cargill beef plant in North America. I think that's doing bad for somebody who can't do higher math, still can't do it. I had to drop a physics course. I had to drop a biological engineering, biomedical engineering course, major in psychology to get away from some of the math requirements. But today in research, we're getting more and more math requirements. But then when I review journal articles, I can't believe how terrible the method sections on, on papers. How about two feed trials where they didn't tell me exactly what the feed was that they fed their animals? Like that's pretty important. A cancer study where they didn't tell how they mixed their samples, what type of stirring device they used. They used different stirring devices and they didn't write it down. It messed up millions of dollars worth of research. This is where they need a visual thinker like me. I can say now, okay, let's take the feed, for example. Was it whole corn, ground corn, or steam flaked corn? It matters. You've got to write that stuff down. You see, but I see it. I see it. Yeah, you need people like me to check out the method section. I just can't believe it. Stuff that's left out of method sections and papers. And I, that's, I'm, I'm going to be the methods police. Somebody else can tell you whether or not they use the right statistics. But I'm talking about very, very basic mistakes. Like one paper I read, they, all the lab work was totally described. All the instruments they used in the lab, totally described. And the feed was not described ab, uh, accurately. But what they fed these animals. Okay, let's go to the next slide. That was another picture I sent them. See, what I wanted to do is have a 30 second wow. The mistake a lot of people make is they put too much junk in the portfolio. I had one big fold out drawing, pictures, a couple of trade magazine articles, 30 second wow. But the thing is, you gotta show that to the right person. Showing that human resources, that's not gonna work. You gotta show it to the plant manager or show it to the engineering department. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. And I love the fact that the movie had all of my projects recreated. The geek side of me loved that. Also, the movie showed exactly how I think. The movie Temple Grandin, um, it showed exactly how my visual thinking mind works. Let's go to the next slide. And I had a nice brochure and of course it's black and white because colored printing in the eighties was too expensive. Let's go to the next slide. And that's another one of the pictures that got sent to the head of Cargill and half the cattle right now are handled in the center track restrainer system that I designed. I worked on this project in the eighties and the early nineties. 
but we're getting into some bad problems now. There were two big mistakes made 25 years ago, taking all the shop classes out of the schools because we need to hook kids young on tools, find out they like them, find out they hate them. Another mistake that a lot of industries made is shutting down in-house engineering departments. They were full of guys in the shop, usually high school graduates or less, that were making and inventing complicated mechanical equipment. And that's been shut down. I've got a client right now where they need to build some simple hydraulic things and they don't have the in-house capability to do that. And all the local shops are booked because most of the people have retired out. There's a big skill loss issue. Let's go to the next slide. Well, that's just another picture of one of the early projects. And we can go on to the next slide. That was not taken with a drone. That was taken with an Aronka stunt plane about like that. And that's another picture from the from the 1970s. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I'm worried that our educational system is screening out the object visualizers. And you need object visualizers to prevent messes like the Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown. Mathematical engineers calculate risk. Visual thinkers see risk. Let's go back to Fukushima, for example. They did a perfect job of making it earthquake proof. In fact, there's a whole chapter in the visual thinking book on disasters. And Fukushima shook and shook and shook and everything was fine. 20 minutes later, the tsunami came over the seawall, flooded the site and drowned the electrically operated emergency cooling pump. Electric pumps don't run underwater. All I need to know about that reactor is that that pump doesn't run, I'm in so much trouble, it's not funny. Simple watertight doors would have saved it. That's seeing something that might be a risk. Let's go to the next slide. Well, and then let's look at the Boeing mess with the, the Max airplane, two plane crashes. Now I wanna tell you, it's been fixed. I've been on the Boeing Max now several times and it has a good coffee maker. It's one of the few airplanes that got a decent coffee maker and it's fixed now. I wanna make that very, very clear. But when they first had the first wreck, all I knew in like the day later was it was a brand new airplane. I didn't even know what brand of airplane it was. And then when you looked up flight tracker uh, radar, it looked like a roller coaster. And I got to thinking, Boeing is gonna be in deep poo poo over this. Something's drastically wrong with the plane. I didn't know what. And then engineers like to use vague terms like possible impact with train. That's like sanitized speech for crashing. Let's go to the next slide. Now, then I found out what an angle of attack sensor was. And this had failed in the Boeing Max. And you can see that's a little tiny, fragile thing. And it's about the size of this Sharpie pen. And of course, at the airport, I'm looking at them, every single airplane. Now, normally, it measures air angle, and it gives the pilot indication on the, on the cockpit controls that the plane's getting ready to stall. Now, if you play a lot with toy airplanes, and the ones you throw may go up and stall like that. A paper glider will do this, and then come down like that. That's a stall. That's real dangerous in the airliner. So the angle of attack tells you if it's going to stall. Well, normally it just goes with indicator on the on the instrument panel, but they put big, gigantic, huge engines that are fuel efficient on the old Boeing 37 airframe and it tended to stall. So they put this special computer in there that made the plane fly like the old Boeing 737. So you would pilots wouldn't have to do simulator time. And what they did, I can't believe they did this. They took this fancy new computer that the pilots didn't know about wired it to a single angle of attack sensor. And when it got busted, the plane thought it was stalling when it was flying normally. How could you make that mistake? And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that went on, but the original mistake was visual thinking. A bird can just take that thing right off the plane. And they wired the plane's flight controls to one of those, one fragile sensor when the plane has two of them. So the next slide. Yeah, you need the visual thinkers. 
And this is a state-of-the-art port processing plant. In 2019, I went, just before COVID shut everything down, I went to this port processing plant, another one very, very similar, a state-of-the-art poultry plant in the Steve Jobs Theater. And I realized there's stuff we're not making. All of that equipment came from Holland. And that's because they kept their, their um, shop classes. They don't stick their nose up at it. Yeah, there's a link here. Let's go to the next slide. The poultry plant was 100 shipping containers from Holland. And one of the problems we got right now with Italian equipment and with Dutch equipment is getting spare parts. Like one of my clients right now that raises chickens, um, they have this thing called the Apollo poultry harvester. You can look it up, the Apollo, Apollo like the God, uh, chicken harvester, there's videos online of it. And they can't get spare parts. And there's not enough machine shops to make some of this stuff. Now, who builds big food processing plant? What I found when I went back to all my jobs, I've worked for every major meat company, the ones without, with a high school education and one welding class, they would build all the specialized mechanical equipment. I call it the clever engineering department. These are the kids getting screened out. Design the plant layout. So what's the university trained engineer do? Boilers, refrigeration, calculate roof trusses, power and water requirements. And the problem is the retiring object visualizers. Also our non-mathematicians, we're not getting replaced. We're losing skills. It is a problem. Let's go to the next slide. Visual thinkers, people with autism, ADHD, we're all bottom-up thinkers. Verbal thinkers are top-down. Verbal thinkers overgeneralize. And if you think that what I've got is just conjecture, um, I got a whole chapter in visual thinking on science. There's a whole bunch of papers show that these different kinds of thinking exist. But my kind of mind's a bottom-up thinker. Specific examples are formed with, co with a, you've, concepts are made up of specific examples of things. It's also sensory-based. It's not word-based. And when you're working with animals, animals live in a sensory-based world, not a word-based world. Let's go to the next slide. All right, what are some tips for working with some of the minds that are different? If I was a computer, I'm an Intel 286. Okay, if you're a computer geek, that's the very first integrated chip computer. Tiny memory, a tiny, tiny processor. But I got a huge memory. So don't shove me into the, some multitasking chaos. I'm going to have a hard time doing that. And I have almost no working memory. And any task with multiple steps, I need, I need a pilot's checklist. The other thing we got to do is take these autistic kids and stretch them slightly outside their comfort zone. Give them choices. I'm seeing too many kids with labels getting too overprotected. They're not learning shopping, handling money, simple social skills like shaking hands. Because I'm seeing lots of granddads coming up to me and they discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. I'm seeing that all the time and lots of hands-on activities. Let's go to the next slide. What's the ultimate goal of education? Where is a student 10 years after high school? I was working on those dip that projects. That's what I was doing. There's too many kids that ought to be out fixing things in factories that are playing video games in the basement. I wish they were getting top jobs with the video game industry, but they're not. And we need them to fix stuff like elevators. Yeah, I know, I'm not worried about falling down the shaft, but I don't particularly want to get stuck in one. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, that's my last slide right there. And uh, now we've got plenty of time to open everything up for questions. And this is the part I like talking about the best, doing questions. Grace? Um, oh, and I forgot to mention about the Steve Jobs Theater. Uh, the structural glass walls designed in Italy, made in Germany and shipped over. The roof came from Dubai, carbon fiber roof. See, there were four things I visited. The poultry plant, brand new one, two brand new pork plants, and the Steve Jobs Theater. And then I realized we had a problem with skill loss. Beef, we actually still know how to build. 
but they're getting gray. Uh, and I'm concerned about who's going to replace them. They're great people. They're building plants right now. But I'm very, you know, there's a price for taking out shop class. Another mistake that got made, the same time that shop class was taken out, 20 years ago, meat companies and other companies had big in-house engineering departments full of shop people that would invent new equipment and patent it. And a lot of that equipment that was made, this place called the Montfort Fab Shop, that was the engineering department of a big company. They no longer exist now. But then as the plant got some new owners that got shut down, other places shut that stuff down. And now they have to import all the equipment. It's a problem. And now that the Montfort Fab Shop's gone, and I drive by it, and I cry every time I drive by it. They fixed trucks in there now, took out all the shop equipment, sold it. But they had nobody to run the shop equipment. Hmm. And this has happened in, with a lot of industries. Car industry made the same mistake, taking out in-house engineering. Yeah, in the short run, that made money. 20 years later, it's biting them in the butt right now. You see, this is one advantage. I've been in the industry for 50 years. Because I remember when the Montfort Fab Shop was going full blast, they built a lot of my stuff. We got one shop left that can build my, my center track restrainer system. And one of the problems we've got right now is price gouging. Big time price, price gouging. Big time. Like five times higher than it should be. Shall we open it up to questions? I know Kat has a question. I know there's well, going to be I see here that about there's a Catherine was saying, happily note that my kids in a USA elementary school are in STEM class. Great. There's some schools doing it. This is where some of this stuff is coming back. Texas is putting it back. Minnesota's putting it back. Some states are doing it. My old elementary school, I went and visited them just recently. Beautiful shop. They said we're a throwback to the 50s. <laughs> so some people are realizing now that this was a mistake. And I'm sure here's someone um, um, talking about a revival of the skilled trades. They're realizing it was a mistake. But we still have a lot of parents, like I've talked to a lot of parents of autistic kids, and, and um, they put too much emphasis on the university degree and not enough emphasis on, well, skills. How do you hold a job? How do you keep a job? Just really important stuff like that. You know, we're starting to see it, but we had to get in a pile of trouble. And I talked to a lot of big corporations and I said, the first step is realizing that people think differently and we need the different skills and they can work in complementary ways. Another problem I'm seeing right now, I don't know what they're teaching at the university, but the kids aren't learning how to write. I've got, um, I've got students who they're not getting their theses done. Their writing skills are terrible. And I'm talking about writing composition. And I suggest them read your paper out loud, but they didn't have teachers correcting their papers. They didn't have to write papers. And I'm not the only professor complaining about awful writing skills. And here, Abby's saying about education swinging to extremes. Yes, I totally agree with it. Yeah, and arts need to be part of the STEM education. And I did a book signing for visual thinking at um, uh, at Harvard and in the physics building. And they had a makerspace in there, 3D printers, sewing machine and crocheting. This is Harvard physics department, realizing that maybe some of these students need some hands-on things. But the problem is the ones that will be the best at the hands-on won't be there. See, that's the problem. You take something like the Mars rover cameras. The mathematical engineers got it to Mars, but I've got a picture of those cameras that I found before they were installed. They're small. Each camera will fit in a shoebox. Somebody made those on a workbench. Beautiful hand-done wiring on them. That doesn't get enough credit. We do have a makerspace in Cambridge. If you ever want to check it out and come visit us, welcome. Well, and, that, and I think that's just great. And I get asked all the time, you know, we still have states where there's some states where in high school you can learn, you can enter English, algebra, and sports. That's about all you learn in that high school. And there's other states where that's not true. And the U.S. is a big, diverse 
country and that each state does a lot of stuff just on its own Beautiful. but a lot of places are just teaching to the test but okay if you're going to go get a liberal arts degree why don't you um, i was looking at a thing on the other day on what were good majors and a plain english major got a higher ranking than maybe a journalism major in terms of helping you with a job because you're an english major you're going to want to know how to write when you come out of there Looks like we've got a lot of questions here. Sarah has oh, good. hand raised. Sarah, hi. Oh, hi. Thanks, Tyler. Um, Temple, really great to meet you. Um, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if it's so much a question, but I'm just really encouraged. Um, I have a background in contemporary dance and always consider myself a embodied thinker. Um, I experience the world through my body and through touch. Okay, and that would be what Gardner calls a kinesthetic learner. Exactly. Yeah. So and I'm also... Yeah, and I'm also reminded of um, two, my uncles, they're twins, my mother's brothers um, have autism. And I remember at my sister's wedding, we were dancing and it was quite incredible because when I was dancing with um, one of my uncles, I felt that language or that way of, of communicating with him really made sense for both of us. Um, so I'm just really encouraged that you are here talking about visual learning. I don't know if you have anything to say to that relationship between visual learners and what I consider kinesthetic learners. And, well, those... and, and I didn't include kinesthetic learning or, you know, or, you know, like ability in sports and things like that. And, and yes, and that's definitely another, some people experience things, you know, to things like dance. And that's one of Gardner's. I went back and I compared Gardner's back. To, see, Gardner's, you know, has more categories and I, I, some of them would be combined into you know one of my categories but kinesthetic would be would be separate um but i'm cons oh here's somebody uh, abby's mentioning as far less mending and repairs and we don't fix things i read an article about how wasteful the clothing industry is people buy all these cheap clothes and um it's uh it's just so wasteful. Stupid ripped jeans. You pay people in China and Bangladesh to destroy jeans. And then they don't last very long. I think they're the stupidest fashion thing. And, and they're a wasteful fashion thing. You know, the amount of clothes that you're going through. Yes, I have a lot of Western shirts, but some of those shirts are 25 years old. And yeah, you know, I had to get rid of some of them that outgrew. But I'm not buying, although I, during COVID, after COVID, I bought one pair of pants and a wallet and I had to break down and buy a new carry-on bag because the wheels were breaking and I was afraid I couldn't get the handle collapsed and I wouldn't be able to get it in the overhead. Yeah, that got to the point where it had to be replaced. No, we need you know, a really good job for some of these autistic individuals is sort of repair places. Would be, you know, uh, these would be good businesses. I remember my mother telling me about the depression and how they were rationed on shoes. And, and she'd say, we got one pair of uh, sneakers or gym shoes, whatever you want to call them a year. And they'd patch them with cardboard and this sticky stuff because they had to make them last for a whole year because of rubber rationing. We've and got gasoline rationing and all that kind of stuff. She, she would tell us about that. She grew up during the, during the depression. Can I read this comment from Cheryl? I think she brings up a good point. And then we'll get to Rachel on camera. Um, uh, Cheryl okay. says, unfortunately, I've seen uh, uh, vocational courses slowly introduce more and more essay-based assignments, and they're becoming more academic. That the course leaders keep insisting on math and English is the main focus, and we're losing skilled trades. So the top people and society need to start valuing those vocations more. Hopefully, the top pe people at the top will listen more to you. Well, I hope so. You see, that's the verbal influence. They've done that with math, too. And the math kids would rather have an old-fashioned algebra book you get out of the alley, out of the attic. That's a book I'm going to use for doorstop. But when you look at it, it's all algebra, no words. That's what a math kid is going to gobble up. And there's been a lot of, I've talked to a lot of parents where you have an autistic math kid that can just do it in his head and they want to force them to do it the verbal sequential way. I had I I um, had some interesting book experiences while I was out on the tour. They uh, put me out in a really interesting hotel in Evanston, Illinois, where uh, I was called the Graduate. Where your key card for your door was some kid's ID card from the 30s. Then I get up in the room, and his textbooks 
are in my room from the 30s. And I wish I had had more time to look at them, but I opened up the electrical engineering text and it was much more applied. Okay, it talked about different things and they had math there, but each math was for a different applied thing. And I actually photographed the um, reference for that. But I'm kicking myself, I didn't do that for the Western literature book. Okay, so it's all those anthologies. You got Shakespeare, Plato, Socrates, you know, Dickens, you know, all the famous writers. And, but the foreword was so straightforward. And I wish I'd taken a picture of it. It said, there's a lot of nonsense been written about the Greeks. You got to remember that on um, the language of, and these things you're going to read, it's the language they used at the time. It was like no nonsense. And now, and, and now today, students will read those same things. And then I stayed in the office of a political science professor. And I had about an hour to look at some of the books in there. And I'm going, this is abstract gobbledygook. It wasn't right or left. It wasn't partisan. But it was weird abstract theory about politics. And I talked about our power plant uh, later, I mean, previously. And they're going to make a decision about whether we keep the coal-fired power plant open. My instinct is to keep it open and run it at a very, very, very low level. Lowest level I can run it and not mess it up. And I'd have to get expert advice from all the creative guys that are in the maintenance department. They'll tell me. They'll tell you everything. There's no suits around. But I, but this is happening. and. And, but you need that applied part. You need my kind of thinker. Looks like we've got about half a dozen questions on the yeah. chat, which I'll we've try got to a bunch right of questions here. Them. A bunch um, of questions here in the chat. Shall we? Uh, let's go to Rachel. Well, you, She's got her hand raised. We talked know. about repairing stuff. I talked about that. Oh, and Fantasia came up. Let me address that. And that's covered in the visual thinking book. That's where the person has no visual thing, no images at all. And I've talked to a few people at Anfantasia. Um, and everything is words. But the thing that's weird is some people in Anfantasia dream in pictures. That's the thing that's weird. And they tend to go into jobs like math, engineering, uh, but all the mathematical side of it. And then you have hyper fantasia, which is, you know, someone where you think very vividly in pictures. And people that have and fantasia can drive, so there's no problem with seeing. You know, the thing, but the thing is, kids need to be exposed to things growing up. I've looked into a lot of how kids got into different things and early exposure. I got into cattle. I came from a non-ag background. I got into cattle because I was exposed to them early in my, as a teenager. Michelangelo, grubby little 12-year-old, running around churches, seeing great art. And he, was, and he grew up with stone cutting tools. Then he got mentored. You see, it starts exposure and then he had mentored. I had a fab, fabulous science teacher who gave me interesting projects. So I was motivated to study because studying was now a pathway to a goal. I still couldn't do algebra. The other classes, I just goofed off. Yeah, and then the keen aesthetic, we think we've discussed that. How and, and the reason I didn't go into that is I'm, I come out of the industrial side of things. And so I was looking at, you know, things where we're getting, you know, huge skill loss. How do we mend and repair more things when you have to? I'm thinking about the computer monitor that got thrown away that I didn't know how to fix. Samsung monitor, screen was fine and it started to flicker. And then it would eventually stop flickering. But then it got to where it flickered all the time. I couldn't use that. And I looked it up online and had a, the power supply went out. They put a cheap piece of garbage in it for a power supply. And I could have fixed that, but I'd have to take it all apart. I know how to solder. Then I'd have to figure out how to buy a, another power supply online. I probably would have to make an external power supply in a plastic box. I've got to make it so it's shockproof. 
and I could have built an external power supply for that monitor. And I kept it for a couple of years. And then one day we were doing a big house cleaning and ended up in the dumpster. And, but let's say I was in a situation, I know I'm of course on my aunt's ranch back in the sixties, we didn't have computer monitors, but let's say we did. I would have fixed that monitor because we would have had to. Now you see on some of the stuff there's not enough have to. And when it comes to clothes, I bought some pants at a trendy place. They wore out in six months where I had to get rid of them. I'll let that give Walmart credit. I buy Walmart pants now and they last. And I just bought my latest pair it's from Bangladesh. <laughs> you know, they, but better quality. Oh, but, you know, people, people want to be sustainable. I'm a, kids need to cut back on fashion crap they buy. Shall we go to- I don't, uh, I don't, I don't buy pants question. until I have to. When they get worn out, I have to buy them. I think, go ahead. We, we, we live in a wasteful society. Can I ask when, a question? And one thing on my aunt's ranch, they my aunt lived on a beautiful ranch, but they were cash poor. She would save all the Christmas wrappings from the out-of-town presents to use for the next Christmas and put them in the Christmas box. They had to. They didn't have the money to buy Christmas wrappings. So somebody would send a beautiful present, well, they'll unwrap it really carefully and reuse the paper. They did, my aunt did that. I heard somebody's voice. Sorry, I didn't catch who that was. Oh, that's okay. It's, it's me. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, it's lovely to virtually meet you. And I have an autistic eight-year-old daughter. So I remember watching the movie about you when she was, before she had words, we're going through everything. And it was so helpful for me. Um, she has a different journey, but being able to just understand a little bit more, you know, from your story. And it was really encouraging. So I'm a college professor and I, um, I actually work with autistic students. I'm, I'm in nutrition. So I teach a cooking class and what okay, I wanted good, to share good. Well, that's a hands -on yeah, it's a class. life skills class. And what I wanted to share is I had out of a, like in our lab of eight students, these are students like you're talking about with incredible giftings, with yeah. expertise in all these areas. I think six out of eight had never used a stovetop. Most of them well, had and, and, never. And I, had, I had a student in my class last year who never used a tape measure or a ruler. Yeah, yeah. And so my question for you, you know, as a parent, like, you know, I have an autistic child myself, you know, what is the, the like your message for parents? Because I think there is a concern about, well, we don't want to push our kids too much. Oh, no, no, no. I, that, you know. I am appalled at the amount of fully <laughs> verbal autistic kids that have never gone shopping by themselves. They've never done laundry. Uh, they haven't learned budgeting. When I was a little kid, I got an allowance and mother didn't buy comics and candy and stuff like that. Those she considered were allowance items. And if I wanted a 69 cent toy airplane, I got 50 cents a week for allowance. I had to save for it. I was learning that as a little child. And I'm realizing how important that was. This is very basic stuff. And they're not learning these things. Also working. How about chores when they're little? How about volunteer jobs at a church or something or an old folks home or something where it's on a schedule outside the family, walking somebody else's dog. And then they need to get real jobs before they graduate from high school. Well, I like what everybody's saying here about the hands-on repair shop thing in the UK. Um, yeah, we need to be doing more of that. But we've got kids today. Okay, I talked to a student yesterday. She did not know that we got a power from a coal-fired power plant. She did not know that. This computer's running on coal right now. And yes, that does have to be phased out. But right now there's another city that's put in a, a hundred, a, a thousand acres of solar panels and they're gonna turn off the, the, their plants kind of decrepit one, coal-fired power plant. What happens if monster hail takes out the solar panels? And they might be cheap ones. Solar panels degrade. They don't last forever. They degrade. No, I'd, I'd want to find out what's the lowest I can run that plant. You see, it, it damages the plant. Shut it down completely. That, it will damage it. I know that. But I'm like, 
okay, let me find a maintenance shop in that plant, get a loan with them somewhere away from the suits, they will tell me. But you see, that's because I spent 25 years in heavy construction. I spent a lot of time in plant maintenance shops. But it worries me that we're going to have people making decisions about this stuff. We are, yeah, we do have to phase it out. Yeah, what will be the thing that needs to be phased into eventually? Next generation nuclear liquid. No ho gnarly, horrid emergency cooling pump you have to worry about. And no pools full of spent kits fuel rods. Eventually, that's, what, that's eventually what has to replace that power plant, eventually. We've got a few questions. Um, I want to get to Jenny's but question. Right now, I want to phase into it a little more slowly. Could How, how hard would it be to convert it to natural gas? I mean, people need to ask these questions and talk to people that actually know something about it. You hear all this stuff just discussed in such an abstract way. What's going to happen to the city with a thousand acres of solar panels if we had freak storm and got baseball sized hail? We've had it. Now I'm remembering the girl that was killed on the Ferris wheel at the amusement park in Denver 20 years ago, baseball sized hail. Yeah, those are the kind of things I think of. Okay, here's a daughter, Steve. My daughter's diagnosed autistic, struggles with everything non-visual. Okay, I'm gonna assume, okay, English writing. Okay, what are the ex more exact things that she struggles with? I need more information. Electric cars running on coal? Well, yes. If you have an electric car here and you plug it in, it is charged by a coal-fired power plant. I am powered right now by a coal-fired power plant. And the coal is really cheap. They bring it, haul it in from Wyoming. And I've watched that plant unload those coal cars. They move them up and they dump them down a thing. It's like a, a grain. It looks like a feed mill, except it's just heavier. Dump out the bottom of the rail car and then you pull another one up. Yeah, these electric cars are running on coal. But the thing to do, okay, we switch over to some renewables. The other thing we got to do is somebody's got to maintain those renewables. We had the top fall off a windmill that was put in 20 years ago because nobody maintained it. Well, that's where you need people like me. And the thing is, you get an autistic person in charge of those windmills. Those windmills would be the most important thing in that person's life. He'll be in love with them. He'll make sure they run. We need that skill to keep this infrastructure stuff operating. You need people that really like it. Now, I can't do anything about baseball-sized hail and solar panels. Yeah, golf-ball-sized hail, they were staining. How, are we doing how, do you, how do you tell what kind of thinker you are? Well, in, in, there's a whole chapter in the book with a pile of references on some of the studies. And by reading the book, you can kind of figure it out somewhat what kind of a thinker you are. Um, but the my kind of mind usually can't do algebra. Some people of my kind of mind can do geometry. I never got a chance to try geometry because I flunked algebra. And then you've got the people that say, well, it doesn't matter what your learning style is because there's been research that shows that it doesn't matter. Well, that might be true for the middle of the road kids. There's a lot of kids that are mixtures. If you take these kids to the extremes, that's where it does matter. Okay, now does the, what kind of thinking you have to affect the study? Yes, your mathematicians are gonna end up in, in the mathematical parts of engineering, computer science, Physics, chemistry, these are all things where you have to have high levels of math. But then you need me to go, you didn't tell me in the method section of the paper which stirring device you used for your cancer cells. And it wrecked millions of dollars worth of research. And the article that was in one of our science magazines, the devil is in the details, the title of the article. 
Well, the thing is a throwaway culture. Um, see, I was, I was just old enough to where people remembered the Depression. So we weren't throwing out so much stuff. You know, like I was the oldest, so I got new clothes. But Isabella had to wear all, my sister had to wear all my hand-me-downs. And then Katie, my other sister, six years later, wore all the most hand-me-downs. Yeah, the thing is, we don't have to. If I had to, that computer monitor would have been fixed. I still feel really bad about throwing away that computer monitor. Another printer I threw out, I found out. So I took it apart. There was one little roller that was misshapen. Now, you could have maybe gone to a high school kid, had a 3D printer, and have him print me a new roller. It's all that was wrong. Stupid paper would feed into it. It's all that was wrong with the printer. You know, and I don't, and I kind of feel bad. I chucked out that printer and I chucked out that monitor because I didn't have to figure out how to fix it. We're just at five o'clock. Should we do more questions? Do you have time? I can do some more. more. I'm I don't I'm not under time pressure. See on my other uh, talk I did, I had to was under time pressure, but here I'm not. Great. I can stay on for a while if people want to stay on. Okay. Because I really like talking about this stuff. And I'm especially concerned about my kind of mind getting screened out. And you need us to fix stuff. One thing that COVID showed is it big is fragile. And I don't care if it's meatpacking plants or it's um, getting computer chips. A centralized supply chain is very efficient. But when it breaks, you're in trouble. And we had two giant pork plants in the upper Midwest shut down due to COVID. 300,000 pigs had to be destroyed on the farm and thrown away. That's terrible. They went big breaks. There's one big chip factory. If it goes down, it might be a while before you get a new car. You know, and then you might get the people that are really good that'll take apart old electronics, take components out of stuff, go in the junkyard and yank chips out of out of cars and use them for fixing. You know, you could do that if you have to. Well, the thing is, the thing to do. You know, the other problem we got now with recycling, like recycling clothes. They got more clothes than what they know what to do with it when you send them to a foreign country. We have an interesting comment from Luz here. Um, I'm an autistic, I'm good with words, and have been able to make a living working with words as a freelancer. I'm able good. to work in offices so that might be a little bit of the in between i guess that you're well, talking about. there's also a type of autism that's totally a verbal thinker and some of the things they might be very good at is um a specialized retail there's been some real successes i did a talk with a bank a big bank and they had two of them that sold fancy financial products complicated products i don't understand that um uh, they could explain to customers or there's been some successes with selling cars because they would know every car that's out there on the floor. They would know it. And that can be a very good job for the verbal kind because there's an extreme verbal autistic mind that uh, could care less about tools and building stuff, art, any of that stuff. You see, the thing is, is that people think they, they the visual thinking, the hands-on stuff's a lesser mind. I can tell you. I was over on the jobs when they redid the Cargill plant in, in the early 90s, Fort Morgan, Colorado. I watched really complicated stuff there. And it was the guys from the shop. Give them credit. I'm going to just get some water. <coughs> they need to be given credit. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's not a lesser kind of thought. It's a different way of problem solving. 
when I found out that Fukushima didn't have watertight doors, I'm going, I looked up the historical tsunami data, a 10 meter wall is gonna get breached. I looked it up, it took me about half an hour to look it up, it wasn't that hard. Did it right here on this computer. They, you see, engine, mathematicians calculate risk. Visual thinkers see it. A simple example would be, let's say somebody spilled grapes on the floor at the supermarket. It might be a good idea to clean them up before somebody slips and falls on them. Now I'm feeling squash too under my foot. And then I fall down and bang my head on the side of the produce bin. Yeah, it's not something I want to do. No, they're not lesser options. And the high-end skill trades, I'm not talking about roofing, floor tiles, asphalting a road. That's not the real high-end skill trades. That's just work. Plumbing, electrician, heating and air conditioning, welders that can read drawings and invent equipment. The mom for Fab Shop had a whole bunch of them. They had about 15 guys that worked in that shop. And they invented equipment. And then what annoyed me is a major piece of equipment that's out in the meat plants. I'm not going to say what it is because I'm bashing a person that's still alive. But the guy in the shop did not was not first author on the patent. That really annoys me. The guy who invented it. You know, it doesn't get enough credit. Now we had I we had a guy that, that came here to our to one of my condo or the buildings had rotted, and he figured out how to hold it up with these boards that I've got in my garage, so that he could rebuild the part that was rotted. It's brilliant, just brilliant. And they did it during lockdown. I'd go out every afternoon and watch, keeping my distance. And he just had a little white trailer that he hauled behind a pickup and no degree. But I watched what he did. He was brilliant. Working with words. Well, a lot of people on the spectrum, because I'm working with some of these metal fabrication shops, these people had their own businesses, ranging very large shops, selling stuff around the world to small shops and I have to be vague about what they make because it's still alive and they're not formally declared as autistic or dyslexic but I worked with them. well thanks for all the nice comments I really appreciate that well you see the research teams okay here's Teddy saying that uh, that uh, that he struggles with uh, re working with research teams. Now I tell the heads of big industry that you need to recognize the needs for these different kinds of minds. He said, "I don't know what kind of company he works in." Yep, and then Lee showing his portfolio. He talks about the portfolio. And you have to learn a few things. Like you can't just go and I used to say that visual thinking mistakes were due to stupidity. I made that mistake in my 20s when they designed some rail work wrong in a beef plant and they yanked the whole track down out of the ceiling. And I didn't know about the different kinds of thinking then. I called it stupidity. That did not go over well. What what it was was lack of visual thinking. You know, because I could run the thing in the way they did it. Yeah, I knew it was going to pull the rail out of the ceiling. It wasn't stupidity. It was different way of thinking. See, this is why you need teams working together, recognizing the strengths and the disadvantages of the different ways of thinking. Because some visual thinker in the shop should have said to Boeing, what, are you nuts? You got to wire that computer to single angle attack center, sir? Are you nuts? A pitching can take that thing right off a of plank. I can't believe they did that. Two airplane crashes. Let's call them what they are. Not impact with terrain. Piles of people killed. 
Ethiopian flight was really sad. I cried when I saw the funeral for the flight crew. This young kid in his late 20s flying his dream aircraft, and that thing drills him into the ground. And they had to put pictures on chairs for his funeral, for the flight crew. They couldn't find the bodies. They were pulverized. Plane went right straight into the ground like that. And I'll get upset when I'm talking about that. Tim, seeing those pictures on the chairs. So whatever sued up there, Boeing, made some of those very, very bad decisions. No, it's somebody that should have been stopped right in the beginning. Now they've got it fixed now. It's wired to both sensors. Pilots now do simulator time where they have to go into the simulator and they duplicate those accidents in the simulator and the pilot has to be able to recover and, and do the uh, runaway trim, hit the runaway trim switch. Um, and they wanted to avoid the simulator time was part of the problem. No, every pilot now, oh, that's fine. The only way I know it's a max because on the little emergency card, it says Boeing max. It's on nothing else, has to be on the emergency card. It's on nothing else. And I pull out the emergency card and I go, hmm, is this a Boeing max or is this some other? No, I'm not worried. I've been on that plane at least three or four times now. It's fixed, confident of that. I wouldn't get on it if I didn't think it was fixed. I see Teddy has just popped up on camera. Did you want to elaborate on your um, uh, uh, comment or add anything about the industries yes. and stuff that you work on? Hi, Teddy. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for that. Your thoughts, Temple. And yeah, you know, I am I work for an independent research institute that does a lot of federal contracting work here in the States. And what type of contracting work? So I don't it's need to know who the customers are. I just need to know get an idea of what the work is. Right, exactly. So it's um qual like qualitative research, social science, public health. Oh, social science, okay. Yeah, yeah. So looking at you know a lot of data, I work with a lot of data, which is great. Um, but then when it comes time for me to, you know, I want to speak up about something I'm yeah. seeing, kind of like danger, danger, then you know, things tend to move so fast in this environment that they there's not a openness to slowing down and saying, oh, OK, maybe we should listen to what Teddy's saying. Yeah, it's that's right. More yeah, like that's, that's right. too many details, too much information. So well, the thing, let me tell you what I had to learn. There's a wonderful concept we use in food safety called critical control points. Critical control points. Love it. Because out of all that mass of detail, let's say you have 100 details, maybe 10 of them are really important. And those 10 that are really important, let's say, I'm going to have to use an example from animal welfare, lameness in cattle, for example. Right. 10 different things can cause a cow to be lame. I don't measure those 10 things. I measure the lameness, which is the outcome measure of 10 other things that can make a cow lame. I love the critical control point approach because you can't measure everything. And, and a main key indicator for welfare in dairy cattle is lameness. And then it's up to the veterinarians and the managers to figure out why they're lame. It could be disease, it could be injury, it can be a genetic issue. There's a lot, there can be a feed additive issue. There's a lot of different things that can make them lame. Yeah. Thank you for that. And the yeah. other thing here, uh, like what Jenny had to say here on the chat, um, you know, being able to see the big picture. You see, there's a lot of this. There's a famous book about dyslexic CEOs. Hmm. And they were very good at running their companies because they could see the big picture. And and I'm concerned Okay, like right now, one of the reasons why I've been doing these talks to big businesses is for their disability and their neurodiversity stuff, which is good because I got to talk to steel company. That was one of them, a computer company, IBM, pharmaceutical companies, banks, tech companies, just all kinds of things. But what I'm seeing is in some cases, the disability community makes a silo inside the corporation. 
And one of the ways to prevent that is you have to have a high level vice president in some of the department be really interested in this. And the other thing I found is that programs that lost some successful have a champion. And if you lose that champion, I have one company up for Google will not say what they do, major name. And uh, their champion had a health issue where he was incapacitated and the program deteriorated. It was a blind person where they made an update on computer software and nothing was done to fix it and she had to quit. That's bad deterioration. See, see, and the thing is that software fix could have been real simple. Maybe she couldn't even log into the thing. I don't know. And somebody never checked into it. See why she could no longer do her job on the computer. Oh, dyslexic advantage. Yeah, that's probably the book. Uh, there's a guy named Frank West. Uh, he's got a lot of stuff on dyslexia. Oh, wait a minute. Is it Tom West or Frank West? Uh, I've got it referenced in visual thinking. But you see, the problem you get with the different labels like dyslexia, autism, ADHD, they form their own silos. Another thing I've seen is you have the twice exceptional, where maybe you're gifted, but you're also autistic. They form silos. Like when I go to different conferences and I check out book tables, there's very, very little overlap. But I, when I talk to business people, you don't hire these people just to be nice. You want that power plant to not fall apart. That's why you hire them. They have all this frozen stuff in Texas. The thing is so stupid about it. It's like 10 power plants froze up. It's a disaster. Um, nobody discussed what froze in each station. What froze in each station? And then you can figure out how hard they might be to winterize. Nobody discussed that. Yeah, how do you get adults to listen to your ideas when you have a solution or an answer to a pro program problem? You know what I did? I wrote about it. I'm talking about it. I'm very careful when I trash clients not to tell you what they do. But okay. I, when I designed cattle handling facilities, let me tell you what I did with cattle handling. I would publish articles on how to build the handling facilities. That's what I did. And then when I talked to the business people, yes, I wanted to be nice to cattle. Boy, I worked the workman's compensation card accidents to people. Oh, you better believe it. I worked that into my cost benefit analyses. But I want to make it very plain. They need these skills. You don't, you can't talk about, like, well, what froze in a, in a power plant? The turbine hall? What froze on the wind turbines? And that one may be a real mess to fix it. They're not winterized. But what actually froze? And then you start deciding which ones we could fix relatively easily. That never got discussed. This is serious stuff. People died. I'll never forget the picture of the hotel corridor with ice chandeliers coming out of the ceiling in a hotel corridor. I'm very glad I was not there. See, that's a specific example of one picture that really attracted my attention. But I think, you know, on some of the things I wrote about stuff that helped me to be effective in my cattle handling work. CJ also mentioned that there are an 11 year olds in the US. So she's coming, uh, they are coming from the perspective of, um, I, I guess, being 11 years old and like how to get, how to communicate to um, audiences older than them. Well, the thing is, what, what do they want to communicate? I don't have enough information. Well, visual thinkers are detailed. And you have to remember, I, now in the beginning, I nitpicked jobs in the beginning. That's something I had learned not to do that. Certain amount of mistakes get made on jobs. And you have to work how to fix those. But then there's a point where you do something really stupid. I'll give you an example. How about a verbal thinker, meat salesperson, decides to remodel and expand a meat packing plant 
And he's told by all the people that work for him, he doesn't have enough wastewater treatment to run that expanded plant. And he doesn't listen, builds it anyway. Multi-million dollar screw up when it was shut down by the town. I was on that job. My cattle stuff worked. Big egomaniac. There's the Thomas West book. Yeah. Big egomaniac. And he wouldn't listen to anybody. The plant closed. It was a complete total screw up. No, you see, you need the different kinds of minds. The other thing with a lot of these big shops, you've got the creative visual thinker. And in a lot of cases, the spouse would run the business side of it. Or they got to hire somebody to be their verbal thinker. Somebody's got to do payroll and pay the vendors and uh, send out the bills and pay the taxes and do all the stuff that you have to do to run a business. Jemima has her hand raised. Um, okay. Would you like to ask her right. question? Okay. Hi, Temple. Thank you so much for your time. You're really inspiring. Um, I'm a creative uh, neurodiverse uh, business owner and something I've noticed that a lot of our female founders are also very neurodiverse. So do you think that being a neurodiverse individual running a business, specifically uh, women, is kind of a superpower? I'm just curious to know your thoughts. Well, on I don't that. know. I was, uh, you know, I mean, I had my own little business. What What do you do in your business? So I run a photography and videography agency for businesses. Okay. Okay. Well, make yourself really good at what you do. When yeah. I started out in the 70s in the Arizona cattle industry, I can tell you being a woman was a much bigger barrier hmm. than being autistic. I had to make myself good at what I did. And I sold my jobs by showing off drawings and pictures of jobs. Hmm. And that also wrote about how to build things. I wrote about how to handle cattle. Lots of just really useful how-to articles. I did a lot of that. And then people, then since I wrote all these how-to articles, people would come to me for expertise. Mm. That was really good. So did you find being a, a woman in business, did you find any other women that were neurodiverse? around you oh, how did you time, kind of there were no women in working out in the, in the yards with the cattle in the <laughs> early 70s you had women as secretaries but there were some women working in agriculture journalism and so i i there's a scene in the hbo movie where i get the editor's card and i start writing for the magazine <clears throat> i was a lot more accepted there because women uh, were doing journalism in the 70s and I got a reputation for it, but I covered a speech at the cattle feeders meeting. It was summarized accurately. You know, I made myself good at what I did. And I think the best thing to do is make yourself really good at what you do. The other thing I recommend is you always protect your portfolio. With all this electronic stuff, your very best work, let's print it out, put it in a dark closet so it won't fade. <laughs> I've heard too many stories about some ancient hard drive you can't get the stuff off of. It disappeared from the internet or whatever. Protect your portfolio. Then if you lose a job, you've got portfolio to go get another job. Because if you're doing, see, I was doing stuff where I could show off drawings. I could show off um, pictures of jobs. That's how I, sold jobs. I showed off examples of my work. That's how I sold projects. Super inspiring. Thank you, Temple. No, and then make yourself really good at what you do. I will. I think, you see, I think the best way to get, you know, like, get accepted is be very good at what you do. Mm. The other thing I do, I have this concept I call project loyalty. Yes, I voted in the last um, midterms election, but that's private. And um, I keep that private because I don't want to lose half my audience. That's why I call project loyalty. Now, there's other people that are going to decide to make politics their career fine. But it often hurts the project if you get too outspoken, especially on radical political stuff. I avoid that. Yeah, you want to show what you can do. 
I mean, I tell business leaders, you need my kind of mind. <laughs> I told the steel company, you need my kind of mind to keep your mill running. Mm. If I went out in your mill, I'd like to go down to the maintenance shop and see how gray it's getting. Because that's something you better get worried about. It's okay for me to talk about gray because I am gray. But who's replacing us gray hairs? <laughs> Do you yeah. think, example, your, your neurodiversity makes you great? It, well, my extreme visual thinking skills certainly helped in my animal behavior work and my design work. There's no mm. question about that. But I also, you know, was brought up and learned work skills. Also, uh, when I did things like in my first job, I criticized some welding. I said, look like pigeon do. And it was explained to me by the plant engineer that that was not acceptable. And I took his advice. Make yourself really good at what you do. Document. I kept pictures of every job I had. Hmm. Yeah. And with this, with this electronic stuff, I'm still a believer in some hard copy of some of your most valuable work. I've heard too many stories about ancient hard drives and uh, losing stuff that was online, losing manuscripts and things. Okay, well, maybe it's um, time to wind it down, but it's been absolutely wonderful um, talking to everybody. Thank you, Temple. Yeah, maybe you could tell me some time. about some of the people that were in the audience. I know we have some neurodiverse people. What, who are some of the other people in our audience today? Who would like to chime in and answer that, either over chat? I can say we had a good number of university folks. I would say at least a quarter of the audience is from the U.S., but um, I guess people feel free to chime in because we've had some academic... Now, from the U.S., were they more people that had businesses or they were in with associated with the university or... I think it was from all over. I I, I saw California, Colorado. Um, Rachel was a teacher. I know that. Um, so some of them are uh, academic related. But any U.S. folks or any other audiences that want to chime in? Uh, CJ is an 11 year old homeschooler with parents that are also neurodiverse business owners. Great, interesting. Well, I'm I'm kind of alarmed at what I've been hearing about the vocational classes making it more verbal. You see, and it was really, I'm really glad that I had a chance to look at this old electrical engineering book from the 1930s, much more applied. Number and of school so, folks from the UK. I know a number yeah. of heads of schools. And oh, yeah, neuroscience research field. But the thing is, we really do need all the different kinds of minds. Like in working on this book, Betsy Lerner took my rather disorganized writing. I'm good at writing a short thing, but I write something long. Man, she just straightened it all out. But then Betsy would not have had the information I had about what was going on in industry. You see, you, you need all the different kinds of minds. Oh, here, somebody has their own photography business. That's one of the areas that my kind of mind goes into. I've talked to a lot of photographers, still and movie photographers, that were, you know, that got exposed to a camera early. And they showed off their portfolio. They worked for TV stations, movie companies, talked to a whole bunch of them. Yeah, another photographer. I was decent at photography. Those pictures of, of the, my facilities that I showed you, I took those pictures. That one that, and, I, and, and the one of the dip, black and white dip fat, we were in Gary Oden's Ronka stunt plane. It was like this. And I'm at the window with the window open. And, I remember when I snapped that picture, I knew I had the perfect picture. We didn't have drones. <laughs> Get a, got in an airplane and we did that. Yeah, photography is one of the fields. I think we can wrap up here. I know you've got- All right, let's um, just wrap up here because I got some it. phone calls I've got to do. Um, okay, here's an autistic 12 year old who loves animals. See, that's another thing that visual thinkers are good at. Now, I've been out to the tech companies, and they, uh, you're going to see that's your programmers, your more mathematical minds. Um, you see, and you need to, like, Zoom's easy to use. That's made by the visual thinker. But then the mathematicians have got to make the program work. Got to make it work. Yeah, we need the different kind of mind. I figure now at the age of 75, that what I need to be doing now is encouraging the younger generation 
I'm not saying that fixing elevators is for everybody, but for certain kind of kids, it'd be the perfect job. I think we can end on that note. So I think we can end on that. Questions. And yeah. uh, thank you so much for having me. My phone's buzzing off the hook in my pocket right now. All right, we'll let you so, go. I the still use things like it's buzzing off the hook. It doesn't have a hook. <laughs> it's an iPhone. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off and thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Bye. Goodbye. For now. Goodbye.